Good morning and welcome to this series of monthly webinars where we at Crystal Specialist Finance aim to provide a platform so the great and good working within the financial services marketplace can help educate and offer hints, tips, ideas to financial intermediaries. Today, we're focusing on short-term finance or bridging finance as it is more commonly referred to. And we really do have an experienced panel of experts to call upon. My name is Jason Berry, and I'm Group Sales and Marketing Director at Crystal Specialist Finance. And joining me today are Gareth Lewis, who is Commercial Director at Specialist Lender MT Finance. Gareth will be known to many of you having occupied various leadership roles with some of the largest specialist lenders in the UK. Sundeep Patel, who undoubtedly is one of the best deal makers I know operating in our sector, and has recently been promoted from the Head of Sales position to Director of Sales at Cheshire Bay Specialist Lender together. And finally, Gary Bailey, who with over 25 years specialist lending experience is a true industry stalwart and is now man managing director of Hope Capital. Industry stalwart, how do you like that description, Gary? Oh, th thanks for, uh, for that. I've been called many things, usually the four <laughs> letters. Uh, that's never, never industry stalwart, but very kind of you, thank you. <laughs> Listen, more, more, morning guys, everybody okay? Yes, Good. morning everyone. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Good morning. Good. Good. Well, just to set the scene for the for the audience today. So we're going to go through the next 60 minutes and, you know, there's an opportunity for all the attendees to actually ask various questions using the chat box. I'd encourage that to be the case as we go through the, uh, the time we've actually got together. And I'll try and ask as many of those questions as we go through the period as possible. But what I promise, yeah, every attendee who actually puts a, a question into the, the chat box, um, if we don't cover it during the session we've got time or we've got together, then we'll certainly make sure that we get replies so everybody does get a, 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 a response um, yeah, before the, uh, yeah, even if it's just post the, uh, post the event. And um, what I'd probably encourage is, you know, question-wise, whether it's in, you know, individual questions about placement of cases, more broadly about the marketplace, or simply ideas that you would like the panel to share. So there's a real broad brush of uh, opportunity. So just really encourage the yeah the engagement really. Um, but pr pr probably first off, I'd like to start with Gary if uh, if I may. So you know today is very much going to be about you know we're looking forward, we're not looking back. But I suppose I'm just interested in I suppose understanding just how busy you are at the moment and maybe the priorities that Hope have have, have got as you go through you know the next um, yeah. 12 months in, in, in 2021. Well, thank you, Jason. Yeah, it's, it's not, not a quick answer, but uh, well, Old Capital obviously ended 2020 uh, with record results, and this is continued into 2021. Uh, we've been incredibly busy, um, and there's no signs of a slowdown for us at the minute. In fact, even with the lockdowns for Old Capital, we, we had new inquiries uh, up by 135%, completions almost 300% up on year on year. Uh, our loan book stands at a record level. Um, and in my opinion, there's, there's a number of factors driving how, how busy we are at the moment. And that's obviously the pent up demand, um, stamp duty changes, uh, driving activity. Uh, mainstream lenders, all still underserving potential customers with restrictive type criteria and slow service, which uh, simply doesn't work for investors. Uh, but as always, uh, many bridging finance lenders responded positively to the client's demand and situation and have done that quickly. Uh, with service innovation and uh, progressive products to keep the, the sector moving. Uh, Oak Capital, for instance, uh, you know, since, since the first lockdown, we've adopted technology such as ID verification by Nevo, automated valuations, desktop valuations, title insurance, no upfront, no upfront solicitor's costs. And all these are initiatives really to support the customer, making it simpler, quicker, while reducing costs for them. Uh, and when, you know, when we then overlaid that with our service and product innovation, and for example, um, we launched a, a truly unique product range coming out of lockdown one that can absolutely be tailored to suit the client's needs and affordability. And don't say unique uh, lightly because it is a unique product. Uh, and followed then by a highly successful 70s collection in Q3, which we launched uh, and so far this year. Um, we, we're only six weeks in, of course, but we've launched uh, the, the refurbishment product range for residential properties. The 80s collection we launched earlier this week for mixed use properties. Uh, and today we've launched the 90s collection for commercial properties. Uh, so these are all products that resonate with the client's needs and are built on the back of our broker partners, such as Crystal. Uh, so all this is, is keeping us very busy, uh, which leads me on really to the second part of your question, which is, you know, what our current priority are, uh, priorities are and uh, obviously, sustainable growth remains our key focus, and to achieve this, 
uh, we've geared up to ensure we continue, you know, lending prudently, um, retain service excellence and coupled with uh, some highly competitive products. So in the past few months, we've had several new colleagues. Uh, our most recent being Sinead Moynihan as sales director, uh, as we prepare for our continued growth in 2021 20, onwards. So extremely busy and uh, focusing on sustainable growth. Okay, great. So, so I mean, there's a bit of a theme there, isn't there, Gareth, if I come to you next in terms of, I suppose, customer journey, technology, um, growth. Is that is that how you see the, 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 the things playing out for yourselves at MT as well? Yeah, look, I think, um, I know you said not to look back, but I think what last year did dictate to a lot of people is the opportunity to look at how you do things, why you do things. The infrastructure around you from a supporting mechanism, um, from technology, uh, from actually how you even process a case. Um, and as you look to evolve and you look to, to improve your business, you always take a, a backward glance to see where you've been what you've achieved and, and obviously what you're then looking to try and do for the future. But you always, one of the big things we're, we're sort of really adamant about is maintaining the DNA that makes the business good in the first place. I think as and as and when you try to go on a growth pattern, um, you could be quite easily uh, pushed into trying to do something slightly different and do something unique um or do something that isn't in your comfort zone and and one of the things we've always said and you know I've I've almost been in this business now 3 years um is the dna that founded this business in in 08 has to run through all the way through to every avenue of opportunity that we do um you know and, and we're doing that within our regulated um proposition that we've obviously just moved into to make sure that the the commerciality flexibility and and service that we've built this business upon and, the, and that's the pride of this business is maintained through the evolution and, and the growth on, on that side of things as well um, okay. because so it can I mean, be quite easy to forget yeah i mean I, i'm interested to talk about the regulated in probably as a, as a follow-up question but i suppose just give give some deep an opportunity as well because again i know together you know very ambitious plans as we go through the yeah this 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 next 12 months and i know that technology and the investment in technology is something that um uh, you've spoke to me about in the past so this transformation is very much yeah. a word that's being used um, you know, widely across the together business at the moment isn't it yeah yeah absolutely so we've you know um, from the first lockdown we, we've restructured and we have focused more on on the uh, customer journey you know historically we, we did large volumes of business monthly it was almost like a high-speed train and what lockdowns allowed us to do is allowed us to, and the pandemic has allowed us to reevaluate the customer journey, just like Gareth mentioned, um, on how we look at cases, how we look at flexibility. But it's also allowed us to evaluate the fact that we need to update our technology, which we are doing. It's an ongoing project. You know, it's not a short term project. However, it's also allowed us to invest and review how we um, uh, look after our people because the pandemic has, has you know, crystal been quite pro prominent on it about mental health and stuff it's it's noticeable particularly in lockdown three you know I, I can say from a, from our business point of view we, we can see that we've had to be a lot more involved with that and caring so it's making sure that yes we want you know a good customer journey we want the technology there but we also need to invest in our people to make sure they've got the support they need because without the people the rest of it falls apart it's a good it's a good point look that um and I suppose practicing, you know, what we preach. So I think, you know, the health and well-being that you mentioned, which is something, you know, Joe and I are passionate about. And, you know, looking inwardly and, and, and making sure that you know, our business really listens to staff and, you know, understands the, you know, probably a flexible approach that does need to be delivered as we go into, you know, what this new world is 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 going to look like is, yeah, is crucial. So that flexibility and listening and, and, and adapting to the talent that you've actually got around you is a is a really good point. But Gareth, you mentioned the yeah the, the, the regulated um, move that you recently yeah recently made. Now I know it's a pretty basic question, but can you just explain to our audience just the difference between regulated and non non regulated, and then maybe tell us why it took you so long to get into that regulated space. Um, yeah, look, plain and simple, a regulated transaction is an owner-occupied 
um, or immediate family owner occupied property where um, you're taking a first or a second charge where the purpose of the funding isn't for business purposes and obviously also covers consumer buy to let as well so if you've had a previous main residence that you've moved into you know that does fall under the the regulated arena as well and then obviously non-regulated is investment property so buy to let semi-commercial commercial um, so anything where it's a, a business orientated transaction from from that perspective so it's, it's relatively clear it's it's quite simple regulated is where somebody lives and resides and they're looking to raise money against it and and then obviously the other side is is where you're looking to earn money out of it more so okay. um interesting question as to why we took our time to move into that arena um look uh it was always something when i came on board i wanted to have a, a a look at it was something we wanted to do as a business because it was an easy win from a growth perspective um, i knew the regulated arena in incredibly well having transacted in the bridging finance arena in the regulated space since m day in 04 so obviously seeing it from its infancy in the regulated side to to, to what it is now um, naturally you do find a lot of lenders do um stay clear because of the nature of the beast there is a lot more rigmarole that you have to go through as a regulated lender um, there's a lot more governance around what you do and how you um, have to look at a transaction so it becomes uh, it becomes a lot more analytical on the basis of what you've got to do when you're looking at a transaction but the, the one thing i was key key fundamental from my perspective was to look at how we could maintain the core values which are bridging finance um, and that was one of the real pressing points for me over the last sort of two years, three years, I felt that um, the regulated arena in the bridging space had sort of forgotten what its core values were a little bit. And it seemed to be a bit more of a race to the bottom when it came to pricing. And that was the easiest win. Um, I felt that actually pricing is a relevant point without a doubt. But a key fundamental, which, which I felt was slightly lacking, was that service delivery and actually that, um, that security of, of knowing that you can get the deal done. So I felt that you know the time was right to look again in our regulated status. So we, we applied last year, um, actually became regulated in March of, of uh, last year as well. Um, so it was a quite a quick uh, transition to get the regulated status, but obviously the timing wasn't right at that point to, to launch a product. Obviously what we did at the back end of last year through, through partners like yourselves is, uh, is soft launch a product out into the marketplace to say, okay, this is my vision. This is the business's vision of what we wanted to deliver. Um, and obviously just making sure that we, what we were trying to deliver was appropriate and, okay. and, and it's gone really well. Yeah. I mean, I know it's difficult to put a, maybe a figure on the, on the total size of the unregulated and the, and the, and the regulated market, but, Sunday, what, what what would a typical so what 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 do you think a typical percentage split would be? So you know a, annually, what what what's a realistic kind of split between the the non reg and the and, and the regs? So I know it'd be heavily weighted towards the non reg, but is it sixty forty? Is it seventy thirty? What kind yeah. of splits would you say? I mean, from a together perspective, you know, it's it's more more an eighty twenty to be honest. You know, we're we're, we're massive in the um, unregulated space. Yeah. However, we have. You know, historically, and and we still do have a fantastic service for our regulated product because it is a more a streamlined product. And you know, um, as Gareth mentioned, you know, there's there's various things you can and can't do in the regulated space. In the market in general, you know, from from what I hear, speaking to, to key partners and stuff, is it's probably a bit higher the split. You know, it might be sixty forty. The stamp duty, um, obviously, uh, holiday has. Uh, driven a lot of business in that space where people are taking the opportunity for potential savings financially to to look at to upscale their house for example a lot of, I live in the suburbs in London it's been a popular theme amongst many people um, but you know as I said it, it's it's a very good product and it's a very good product which uh, with more competition in is excellent but I think Gareth hit the key there pricing is important but it is about service and delivery here and um, and that's the key thing for, on our regulated product. That one of the things that we've always been proud of is that the service is there to get the deal across the line. And sometimes if it's not for not for us, you just got to put your hands up early and say, look, this isn't one for us. But the, the introduction of MT into the industry and regulated is good because more competition is actually better for the consumer. Yeah. Gary, and have, have you got an opinion? Uh, yeah, because obviously way back when uh, I managed to uh, be involved in the launch of the regulated um, 
bridging finance in, in together way back at, at those times. But uh, yeah, I, I think you, you're probably talking somewhere around the 30, 35% mark as we speak at the moment in the regulated space. Uh, I think it is becoming more of a, a mainstream kind of product. You know, I'm speaking with brokers and they're saying they've, they've had kind of a 30% increase in bridging finance uh, inquiries. Uh, and interestingly enough, not from people who would have traditionally looked at bridging finance. So the, the, it is becoming much more of a, of, a, of a first choice product, whether it be unregulated or the regulated space. It is becoming much more mainstream, particularly um, when you look at the reasons why uh, bro you know, brokers and clients need bridging finance nowadays compared to the traditional approach. Uh, of always going straight for a mortgage first and then yeah. realizing it can't be delivered. Yeah. Jason, uh, Jason, sorry, can I just yeah. jump back to something you, you asked previously? Sorry to interject. Um, the difference between regulated and non regulated as well, I would also suggest for a broker uh, in you know, our audience as we sit here now, um, it's, there's two different ways of, of looking at it from a sales perspective as well, because you've got a, a non-regulated transaction, which is a business orientated transaction. There's something they want to do that's fundamentally looking to, uh, I don't know, add rental yield, improve a property, add value, whatever it may be on that side of things. The, the regulated arena, and this is something for brokers to be incredibly mindful of, is more of an emotional transaction. There's a, there's a necessity because they haven't sold their existing property, they're retiring, they're down to whatever it, it may be, but it's an emotional transaction. So then obviously when a broker is looking at the sales pers perspective on that side of it, that's a very different conversation you're having with your client than it is when you're turning around about how much money they're going to make out of this transaction that they're doing over here on the non-regulated side. This is actually about an emotional investment in the property and the dream of what that might be as well. It's, so it's something for your... Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good point, Gareth. And again, before we take our, our first question, it, again, it's kind of linked to one of the questions we had in advance, actually coming into the you know, the session, our session. And it is, you know, when exactly should a bridging or short-term finance you know, be considered by, you know, by a broker or, or, or IFA? So it's kind of linked to what you're saying there. I mean, what, 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 how would you answer that then, Sundeep, in terms of you know, when, you know, when is the... You know, when should a, a short-term solution actually be yeah be considered? So I know we've got um, yeah, yeah we, we, we've got the chain breaks and we've got you know those inexplicable situations where a a, a, a lender can pull you know terms at the at the very last minute. But when 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 should when is the sweet spot and and what is it that advisors should probably be looking for to spot those opportunities? I think you know, Gary made a good point that it's becoming more mainstream. You know, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, various myths to still be busted, shall we say? But the, the reality is, is you know, if you look at since the pandemic, for example, you've got the majority of high street lenders, their staff, you know, they're working from home. Turnaround times aren't there, so speed of acquisition. You know, if that's a regulated space, as, as Gareth mentioned, it becomes personal almost because it's important. So there's there's the regulators, the unregulated side. Again, we're seeing quite a lot of reasons. For example, is you know dev exit. We're getting a lot of those inquiries. Convert permitted developments. You know, has allowed changes to happen to properties. Planning permission changes are relaxed. So, again, people converting office spaces into residential with HMOs. So there's lots of opportunities now. Apart from just speed and auctions, traditionally used bridging, where because of the rest of the market, say the more mainstream lenders in the high street who can still turn these deals out, but the time frame is not going to be enough. You know, bridging finance is that solution. We're doing quite a few cash for cap businesses for cash flow purposes, you know. And another one, while the pandemic's affected many businesses, some businesses have actually flourished, and we're getting a lot of applications for business expansion. And again, so there's the sweet spots actually quite varied in my view. You know, it's the fact it's it's a solution to a means, you know, and I think as long as the, the customer and more of our customers are understanding that we're finding brokers are saying to um, the clients are coming to them and saying, actually, I think I need a bridging loan here because of X, Y and Z. So that education over the years has filtered through, but it, it's actually filtered through to property developers, portfolio landlords and even even the residential and you know regulated transactions because people understand that there is a solution now it's not just if the high street says it will take us eight weeks they have to wait for that to happen and what, what would a typical example be of the, the, the business for cash flow or the business for expansion what would a typical case study look like 
So we, we've had scenarios where people's businesses have flourished due to the pandemic, could be PPE, could be, you know, there's certain markets that have done well, like warehouse spacing, for example, has increased. So they've, they've needed to expand their premises. So they've needed to buy other units so they, they can get a high street bridge uh, loan. They know they can get it, but actually they found something. They want to secure it. The business demand from their consumer is high. So they need to move quickly. So we're finding that's a good example to acquire not just equipment, but premises. A lot of people have used uh, the ability to buy land, will lend on land, um, you know, and uh, build build from land as well, sometimes bespoke premises. So they're, they're some of the scenarios we're finding quite mm. useful for at the moment. I mean, I'm going to ask about speed and, and, and turnaround times in a, in a, in a moment, because, you know, Jim Gillespie, one of the brokers, has, has, has asked about that. So I'll come back to that. But just, just, just before I do, um, well, it's kind of what somebody touched on there and probably go to Gareth first, if that's OK. You know, why did so somebody talks about education? And again, I've, I've heard the, you know, the term education, 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 you know, till in you know, blue in the face, really. But you know, why do we think that there is still a bit of a nervousness? So we talk about becoming, more, you know, the product and the, the interest becoming more mainstream now. And certainly the pricing's improved beyond recognition. But what, why do we still think there is a little bit of nervousness to, you know, to, 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 to the short term finance solution? <sighs> Look, I think uh, ultimately there's still some stigmas attached where people are uneducated or ignorant to the to what bridging finance is truly about and how it can be a tool for everybody. Um, so I think there's an element of there that, that, that comes into play. And I think it's also um, people just don't want to hear why, how, what's going on. You know, over the years, I've done... Ha- countless amounts of roadshows, webinars, whatever they may be on education. And every single time you'll have a conversation with a broker or, or even a client as well, where they go, well, I didn't realize you could do that. It's like the whole um, refurbs, renovations or, or lending on property. Every property has a value at that moment in time. When a case comes to you, it has a value. What Bridging Finance does well is, is ascertains what that value is and looks at the mechanics of that transaction and finds a way to lend against it. So it's a common sense based approach to lending. But because the mainstream mortgage market isn't always... Um, isn't always based on common sense. Unfortunately, it's a computer, it's a methodology, it's a it's an algorithm within a within a system. Um, unfortunately, then people become a little bit blinkered about the the, the nuances of of commerciality of of that flexibility, which bringing finance is all about. So I think it, 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 there's twofold to that i think it is that element of maybe a slight arrogance around people saying well i don't need bridging finance because isn't that you know that unscrupulous era of of yesteryear where it was somebody lending money a loan shark orientated you know they have that you know that wonga element thought process to it um but i think now what you what you are finding because more and more people are talking about bridging finance bigger lenders have been in the space which helps as well okay. i think it gets you to that point where people then start to understand it and realize that it is a, an invaluable tool and gary you, you mentioned earlier about being one of the, the the almost the innovators and certainly the you know the early adopter of bringing short-term finance to the marketplace so you've been banging the drum for for a number of years now and you've obviously seen your progress during that that time how would you reconcile that where where, where do you think we are in terms of the the journey we've gone through and, and and the cycle and where we're at at present yeah well i think that um i think this is something that was created in in the bridging finance market many years ago it almost it almost was portrayed as a mythical art uh when fundamentally the information um, required is the same as, as a mortgage or perhaps even less, uh, but it's all based on common sense view rather than, as uh, Gareth said, you know, on all algorithms or credit scores. So any broker really that is offering a, a mortgage today should at least have some skills and knowledge uh, and and, uh, and they can obviously pick up on the experience of package distributors available out there, such as Crystal Specialist Finance, who can provide excellent support in this arena. Um, but firstly, I, I think the broker needs to recognise a need for bridging finance for the customer, uh, but just as importantly for themselves, and that's to justify their, their time and effort. Brokers who don't have an understanding and perhaps don't even offer bridging finance as a potential solution could be providing a disservice to their clients uh, by missing and, and not providing and ensuring that it's the right product at the right time for that client. But also, it's a disservice to themselves uh, by missing out on incremental income streams and revenue, whilst at the same time diversifying the business and, and de-risking their business model. 
to make it more sustainable. You know, many savvy brokers and successful brokers have embarked on uh, on the changes in, in an ever evolving sector of, of the financial market, uh, having diversified the product range. Uh, and this can be done, um, you know, with the support of specialist brokers such as, as Crystal uh, in this sector um, and other sectors, of course. But by employing the support of specialist brokers, it also allows them to concentrate on their core business so they can have an additional income stream without actually stepping away from the core business because they know they have the support beyond the, the, their internal sources. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned uh, a question from yeah from Jim Gillespie earlier in. It is a, it is around turnaround time. So you know, Jim's asking just what is a realistic um, you know, turnaround time now? Look, I, I know we've got examples, and, and I know we've highlighted some examples in the trade recently with with you, Gareth, and and, and with Sundeep uh, together, where we've 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 completed cases within forty eight hours, completed cases within seventy two hours, and there've been some really nice nice loan sizes. But I think you know what's been absolutely critical to be able to deliver that kind of turnaround time has been the information we've received day one and our ability to then, you know, process it and get it right first time. So just, 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 I suppose, from a service perspective, just how important is it for, uh, for our audience to actually get things right first time when they supply the information? So the placement's one thing, but then providing the information um, so that it gives, it, it equips either Crystal or yourselves to actually deliver the, yeah, the, the, the funding quickly. Just how, how, how crucial is that, and I'll probably stay with you to start with, Gary. Yeah, you, you know, Bridging Finance, uh, you know, was born really as a short-term term funding solution. I know Bridging Finance is the term it's used, but it's a short-term funding solution, really. Um, and it, it's the step into that long-term solution. So you will, you know, obviously Sundeep uh, went through a number of examples of where, where Bridging would, would come into play. But it is where, uh, you know, a client is... It is put in a position where they can't complete the transaction as quickly as they need to do. Often that that may well be through uh, a mainstream lender who's looking to do the longer term um, kind of uh, finance and mortgage for them. Uh, and uh, and I know you know many of, of, the, uh, of the bridging finance lenders do get referrals from mainstream lenders to say you know we can't complete this. Can you help the client to get this over the line quickly? So I think speed is, is a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. It's really providing them with the right solution um, for their particular needs at that time. Gareth touched on before, you know, maybe some more complex kind of cases that quite simply uh, a, uh, an algorithm just can't work through. Um, so by looking at it with common sense, looking at when the client needs the funds, uh, then you know that the speed is a fundamental part of it but the, the one big piece of that and, and i'm sure um, my colleagues here today that they, they, they'll agree is it's the people who are involved in the transaction yes uh, you know, all the bridging lenders are geared for this to make sure that things can happen quickly and they can apply the right resource as are uh, the brokers who, who support us they're all geared for this what we often find is that the clients uh, solicitors may not be and it's, all, it's always important that the client solicitor uh, has had previous experience in the transaction they're carrying out and the gear to the timescales that are required. Uh, that's usually when bridging finance slows down. You've already given examples of 48 hours. Well, yeah. that isn't happening unless everybody's in the same space Absolutely. Uh, because there's so many people involved in it. Um, so I, I think, you know, that, that's my view regarding the speed. It is dictated by what the client needs and delivering on time. Yeah. And, and uh, bridging finance have built for that purpose. Yeah, and, and, and often that, 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 that part of the, 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 the lawyer, the legal aspect is, is, is really crucial, isn't it? And, I mean, so, Sunday. What would your view be? I mean, obviously we've you know, we've had some uh, you know some real, as I say, some 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 fantastic case studies which we've been able to yeah to highlight with you know, with you yeah. guys. But that that ability to get things right first time and that ability to um, I suppose allow the speed to be dictated by you know that information and and and, yeah. and that information supply is absolutely you know pivotal, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's you know the due diligence the introducing broker need to do on the client not just the security but the client the profile is important because the, the turnaround you've mentioned that you know lenders have produced with you guys you know if you didn't have that information up front it would make our underwriters have to come back with many more questions and actually that piece you know and i know you, your team are excellent at it and chris getting that education to those introducing partners is is essential and, you know the exit for example 
output. The exit's a key fundamental point of, of a bridging lender. They need to analyze the exit and we need to make sure that when a case comes to us, that's been properly reviewed and yeah. it's brought to us. That allows us to do get the speed out. However, you know, you mentioned solicitors, it's so important to have you know the solicitors in place of our pipeline. There's not a lot of it that sits in underwriting. The bulk of it, I'm sure the, the other panelists will agree, sits in solicitors, you know, and actually to make sure that everyone's on, on plan with that to make it happen. So, you know, the, the key for me is, you know, making sure that the introducing broker, specialist distributor has done that due diligence with the client, the profile, not just the security, but also the exit, because they're the fundamental factors our underwriters need, need to pick up on. Yeah. And, and Gareth, I know I've, I've highlighted some exceptions there, haven't I? And I absolutely understand yeah, the 48 hours and the 72 hours is is absolutely the exception rather than the norm. But I know you guys produce some really brilliant stats where you're actually tracking the trends in the in the marketplace. So what in the wider marketplace, what are the maybe the typical averages for a, a start to finish completion for a bridging? And how does that compare to MT Finance's actual you know, real real delivery? Really, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and actually, it's something that's come up uh, time and time again of late, because actually, when you look at the stats that come through from the bridging trends data that we pull together and and, um, and highlight to the broker community is actually the turnaround time somewhere in the region of 50 days. Um, but th I think the reality on that is because you've got two schools. And Karen, sorry, that. I mean, to put that in perspective, though, 50, 50 days, that's compared to a mainstream marketplace that at the moment's at 120, 150. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. So. 50 days may sound like, oh, that's that's quite a lot. But actually, in reality, it, it's at least half the time, if not a hell of a lot more than a, than a mainstream mortgage lender. But don't forget, it's not all uh, the thing about speed. Is, it's not just about speed nowadays. It's, it's about certainty of liquidity as well. So, you know, the need for speed, for want of a better expression, is still there. But it's not necessarily that it has to be completed there and then but they need to know that they can get the funding that they require to do that transaction. And then there is a cycle of that transaction going through the legal due diligence that needs to be done. It might be, as you say, we talk about complex transactions. It might be that there's multiple titles involved. It might be there's, uh, there's onerous restrictions on the title that need to be looked at, which is where the more mainstream mortgage market won't look at it. So the need for speed is, is, not just a case of getting from A to B as quick as possible, it's getting from A to B to C and, and, and pulling everything together on that side of things. And I think that's why you guys uh, you know, are, are hugely critical because you'll know the nuances of each lender as well. And you'll be able to then help a broker go, okay, right, this is your deal, this is your transaction. These are the lenders we can look to utilize. And I know if I go to this lender, they're gonna need X, Y, and Z. I know if I go to this lender, they're gonna A, a B, and C. And you'll be able to then go, okay, it, it's formulating that plan of attack as to how to push that transaction over. Yeah, well, and, and, and again, that's a good point. And I think the beauty of the three relationships we've got, you know, with, 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 with you guys is that there's an ability not only to have complementary um, bits of criteria and price that actually we can tailor, but also there's a real appetite to shape and influence future criteria and future change. And we've seen that with all three of you as, as whether it's been the changes to, you know, the seventies and eighties and nineties schemes that Gary's done, or you're moving to into regulated. I think, you know, we've got a responsibility as a distributor, I think, to really gather brilliant information from your know, brokers and our distribution of users, and then use that responsibility to actually shape and influence the future direction of criteria with, with you guys. And I'm really passionate about, about that. And the, the quick question that's coming from, 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 from Amit, I think you know, Sundeep might want to close his ears with, uh, yeah, with this one, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask it anyway. So it's coming from Amit Patel. Um, Amit's got a customer who's uh, an existing customer with together um, for a commercial portfolio in, in, in Scotland. There's, it doesn't specify, but there's a, the borrower's made some, yeah, some late payments in the last 12 months, um, specifically due to, yeah, to, 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 to COVID. But other than, other than that, the profile is strong and the security is yeah, strong. But this it's something that somebody did mention earlier about the opportunities that do exist with, yeah, with rebridging. So rebridging um, is, a, is, is, a, is a growing marketplace, but Amit's got a customer here who, it looks like there could have been some circumstantial um, issues with, yeah, with, with, with with a late payment, which has not been specified. But how would you how would you treat that, Gary? And I know there's probably more information that you'd actually need. But what would you what I suppose what was the wider criteria in terms of you know accepting rebridge and, and, and delivering a rebridge solution? 
Yeah, so it, obviously we do rebridging. Uh, I think I think uh, the other companies here do as well. But um, usually, I, I think it all depends on the circumstances and the exit. Often yeah. the rebridging is where um, a client has come to a certain stage with within the current bridging finance. And for whatever reason, things have been delayed. Naturally, COVID is a, is a good reason today. Yeah, you know, the supply of, uh, of, of materials, raw materials for, for people to complete, um, you know, any kind of development or or to, to complete a, a refurbishment uh, has slowed things down for them. And, and naturally they've had people off site uh, earlier on in lockdowns where they, they couldn't actually progress things. So we, we look at it in, in respect of, um, of, of the situation individually. Uh, the circumstances around it to make sure that they've got a viable exit. The, the reason behind that is not is yes, you know, we have to lend prudently and, and uh, responsibly. But the other side of it is we need to look at it from a client's point of view. And just by rebridging, if they do a rebridge, is it going to help them or is it just going to eat away at the equity that's within yeah. Yeah. the, so the property? That plausibility, I suppose, then, Gary, isn't it? It's that Absolutely. Plausibility is a great word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you, and you've got to look at that to, to help them to make sure that they are making the right decision at that time. Um, now, if, if there's multiple rebridges, then naturally the, there has to be an extremely good reason why, uh, you know, they, they need to move through. And there are, you know, there are some good rationales out there and reasons behind it. But again, as, as Sundik was saying, exit is so, so important, yeah. not just from a lender's point of view, but from the client's point of view. They've got to yeah. make sure that he's nailed on, it's plausible and it's strong. Yeah, and Gareth, a similar kind of story from you, I would imagine. Yeah, look, it goes back to two things you've mentioned previously. Um, the commerciality and flexibility of understanding the transaction and, and digesting the deal as a whole. So obviously why, what happened, what's your security and how you're going to get your money back. That's a key fundamental point to any bridge. But also the one thing you've got to bear in mind is, is that customer, as, as Gary said, and, and I think you said, Jason, sometimes you do have a customer that's that's, buries their head in the sand a little bit, um, who doesn't realise that they have an issue that they need to resolve or is, is just so non-committal to, a, to an exit or an, or an achievable route of getting that loan out. And, and they're the ones you, you need to avoid because you don't want to just be kicking somebody else's can down the road for, for a longer period of time. You need a client who's invested in achieving the exit because ultimately no one goes into a bridge um, without knowing or, or wanting a way out of it. Um, yeah. You know, that's not what it's all about. And Sundeep, I suppose that, that that transparency that exists of being honest up you know, and upfront right at the beginning, but then also recognizing that look, stuff does change as you go through the as you're going through the journey. Stuff, your know, circumstance can change, but it's I suppose it's absolutely crucial as circumstances change whilst you're going through uh, a, 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 an application process. Just that transparency and that um, conversations to, still continues to take place. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you know, just touching back on the previous question. SLAs, you know, if you think about it, the if, if a typical broker is doing seven out of these ten deals with a high street lender on term deals, you know, their SLAs are well published and stuff, and, and it makes sense that, that business is quite rigid. If you move into specialist lending, you know, we could have a case from you know, one of your brokers and it could be a straightforward bridging transaction, easy. Then we could have another case which is foreign national, you know, offshore. That's not gonna be SLAs, and I think. You know, you have to understand it is a more complex arena of lending. So um, having those open conversations and being transparent, you know, we, we will always tell our partners, look, this deal is going to take us an extra bit of due diligence. We may have to get, you know, a, a value out to give us opinions on certain things. So these these are things which um, you can't, I don't think you can just box you can have generic SLAs, but in reality, it's a case by case basis, particularly in regulated world. It's just natural because otherwise you wouldn't be coming to a specialist lender for these nuances and these quirks. Um, but transparency is very important. We, we don't want to promise something we can't deliver on. We want to try and be clear. And Gareth touched on certainty of funding. If we've got a deal, we like it and we've communicated this is a deal we want to do and do it, then it's knowing that once it's got to solicitors and whenever it gets through the process that they know we will be able to deliver. Cause I think that that's particularly important to, to customers themselves at the moment, particularly with the, is that reassurance that they will have that certainty. It's, it's, it's a good point. That. And again, uh, anonymous attendee has, has, has asked a question, um, which is kind of linked to what you're saying there in terms of, you know, we, we talk about service 
and you know service and SLAs we do expect to almost be a be a given and I think again as a distributor and, and and collaborating with you guys as partners you know what we've done at the back end of of last year as a business you know we've had examples as we went through last year where we've got in any particular single month we've used 80 different lenders which you know from a compliance perspective is a compliance dream but it also it's it, you know it, it, it can be perceived perceived as being a little bit unnecessary and ultimately as we go through um I suppose a, a journey where you know price and criteria are important services is, is absolutely crucial but quite often it's words so it's quite often you know we'll deliver the service we'll deliver in you know the, in, in the SLAs and again what we did as a business in Q4 we actually looked and had a you know strategic you know strategic overview of, of all our lenders and we actually uh, we, we've now very specifically got a, a tier one, which you guys all sit on. We've got a tier two and we've got a tier three. And you know, look, there'll be fluidity as we go through the, the year, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But ultimately, um, the certainty and the ability to be able to deliver on what the, um, the, the, that, the decision at the outset, that placement decision is absolutely crucial and we can't have the goalposts move. So I suppose the point on services is that yeah, well, we, we we engage with people who practice what they preach. And you guys, when we talk about service and we talk about delivering to, you know, SLAs, we've got, um, uh, you know, it's not built on quicksand, I suppose, is the point I'd make. Tony Comport's asked a question regarding um, desktop valves and, you know, the uh, yeah, the panel's view on, um, on on those. So, obviously, in that later life market, um, it, pretty much the yeah the valves reduced you know straight away by five percent. But what 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 what's our view on on, on desktop desktop valves? Probably start with you if I can, guys. Yeah, yeah. I think desktop valves, as all the valuations are, whether it's a, a Rick's valuation, an AVM, a desktop, or a drive-by, they're all pertinent for the circumstances at, at the time, either around the economy or um, geared towards the you know what the, the client needs. Um, you know, we, we accept them. Uh, we accept them uh, on, on a broad basis, but obviously on specific cases. Uh, and they give us a, a good insight in what we need to do. There's not a natural 5% reduction or anything like that. We look at it realistically. I think it's very hard. It goes back a little bit to another question. It's very hard to compare certain markets. Uh, so, for example, the mortgage market, it's very hard to compare to the bridging finance market. You look at turnaround times. Uh, you know, and you're looking at 120, 150 day, whatever it may be, in a mortgage market. Th these should be relatively straightforward transactions of people buying a property. You look at, say, the turnaround times in the uh, bridge of finance market, uh, and as Gareth said, it may be 49, 50 days or around that figure. But in that, you've got two day completions, but you also got some highly complex, uh, perhaps commercial transactions crossing land uh, and commercial buildings and planning and all that all going through it, it within that sector. So for me, they are two completely different sectors, um, which takes me uh, back you know, to your original question, really. It's very hard to compare the two things. Uh, but desktop valves, uh, we, we accept them. I don't know what the view of the others are, uh, yeah. but we accept them on, uh, on the right case, which suits what the client needs at that time and suits their circumstances. Well, well, look, we're in a very kind of different lockdown to we were last March, April, and I know we were, you know, we were all... Um, uh, you know, nervous and 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 you know the fact that we were you know th this access for you know, for valuation was so problematic for us. I know that was the, you know the kind of thing that was uh, we were you know, thinking was going to cause like a, you know just a, a nuclear situation for us. It never got got to that stage because lenders did adapt and and did introduce stuff like um, the AVMs. And and what, what what's your view then, Gareth? Look, I think uh, look, there's a place for all of these things in, in the marketplace. We currently um, will always rely on a valuation report. Um, that's just our stance at this moment in time. You know, I think there's still an element of uncertainty when it comes to value. Um, you know, that maybe the stamp duty deadline um, has created a, a, a false boom in, in some price. Uh, we saw a softening last month in value uh, for the first time since the back end of um, of. The, the March lockdown, as it were. Um, so look, that's our stance. But I think every, you know, every form of valuation, AVMs, desktops, whatever they may be, has a place within the marketplace because ultimately there's a there's an element of risk and mitigating of risk. So if you're at 10% loan to value, you can take a different view on a transaction than rather being at 70% loan to value on a unique asset. Um, so there is a place for for all of these in there. And uh, so I certainly wouldn't say that. You know, our, our stance is the best stance, um, but that's where we feel comfortable at this moment in time because there yeah. is a, an uncertain that. element. 
I get, I get that. And what, what, what about you, Sunday? Yeah, so we, we, we've taken a, a more uh, proactive view to desktops now. We've started it uh, initially in our regulated business where we've increased the ability to do more AVMs. So typically after research, we, we expect 50%, plus 50% of our regulated business could now fit on AVMs. Um, we're looking to implement similar measures in the commercial side of our business. However, it's uh, it's a little bit more trickier. There's more complexity involved. So I don't think it will always be as automated and as fluid as the regulated side, but it's something we're looking at because we understand that, um, and we've learned from the pandemic, to be fair, that we need to look at all options, and but make sure it's prudent and right for us, what we do, um, not, not just to protect us, but also to protect the client at the end of the day. Yeah, I get that. And we, we've said how important it is when any kind of bridging solution is, is, is being proposed about the exit. And, you know, just reflecting back to the question a little bit earlier around that, that, that rebridge, we have obviously been in exceptional circumstances, which yeah, we all know about. But ha have you found as a business that because of that circumstantial situation we've found ourselves in, you've actually had to consider extending some of these the, 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 these terms? So rather than actually the rebridge that I think Amit was talking about, you've actually actually ha had to show that bit of flexibility to extend and show some some understanding. I mean, what's what, what's the position of the business? How how's how's the approach been? So from our perspective, we've, we've had that clearly. It's natural that was going to happen. You know, people not being able to redeem. Uh, we've got a team that look at each case individually. They'll actually work with the broker and the client if, if you know, if their broker's happy for that because we want to make sure that um, we're trying to help. But we've been quite lucky, if, you know, since the first lockdown for any originations that have come through on the book, we've had a really, really good success on them. And that probably is down to the prudent underwriting the writers have put in place. While we remain flexible, we did, you know, Gareth mentioned before, if there's deals you shouldn't be doing, then you, should, you just shouldn't be doing them. You should be upfront and honest and transparent. And so we've, we've been really happy the way our uh, uh, asset collection team have, have handled this, the back book. And actually it's been quite good. And that does reflect on the underwriting stance and making sure we always try and look at the client outcome. Yeah. You know, lending the money is the easy part. Getting it back, is that going to be possible? Is the client going to be in a situation where it could be a commercial bridge and actually their business isn't trading? And then, you know, we wouldn't have predicted lockdown free, but lockdown freeze happened. So they do change. I think we just have to be ongoing with communication with partners on that. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. And I, ju I just want to, I suppose, dive a little bit deeper on the on the pricing, I suppose. And um, it, Rob Broom from, from Chartwell has, has asked, and probably direct to, this to you, Gary, if, if, if I may, to begin with, because, you know, we mentioned about you being part of the, you know, the, the, the early early days, early stages of, of bridging. And, and as we said, we've seen this journey continue. But how do short term finance costs really compare against the longer term fixed costs? Well, I think it's, uh, again, uh, probably touched on this a little bit earlier, sometimes it's a little bit hard to try and just compare a long-term fixed cost when you've got a 25-year mortgage compared to something that needs to uh, be around probably for, for a 12 months um, period. It's kind of in every aspect of life, we, we pay a premium for specialism, um, whatever that may be. Um, and so in real terms, you're comparing two totally different products and services. Yeah. Um, a typical bridging finance cost is more interested, in fact, in being able to seize an opportunity and have that certainty of funds um, where, where they will gain a return rather than miss an opportunity due to you know a, a perceived small margin difference. It's all about the, the, the right solution for the right customer at the time um, and does it fit in with what their their entrepreneurial plan is as such? Um, you know, bridge finance should should be when a customer needs uh, in, immediately to need to be fulfilled uh, or can't be fulfilled, sorry, by a longer term product. Uh, because if it should go on a longer term product and it can be de delivered in time, then it should go on a longer term product. Yeah. So they are two distinctly different products uh, that that need to. It's a good point. Be, uh, Ga Gaz, be, it's, 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 it's a good point, and I look at. I think what we and I think Gareth touched on it before and you touched on it as well. Yeah, you know, we've got this, you know, from a dynamic perspective, we've got more lenders in this space. It's an incredibly competitive environment now. And we've seen growth, yeah, you know, over the last you know 18 months, two years, 
uh, alone. And you know, when I go back to you know the early two thousands when I was operating in the you know, that specialist lending space, the it exploded and it became very consumer friendly because of the competitive dynamic that occurred. And I suppose the journey we're on now with so much appetite and so much pent up demand requiring the solution for yeah for yeah for speed and certainty, we can only see. Um, the competitive dynamic uh, improving. That's certainly what we're seeing as a as a yeah as a as a, as a distributor. So we're grateful um, that that competitive dynamic exists. We're grateful that you guys are you know actively trying to deliver the best possible outcome, uh, also the best possible price. And and we can see that, and we've seen it even stretching with the yeah with the LT L, LTVs as well. Um, so just a couple of yeah, couple couple of other questions, I suppose from from the audience. Um, so Derry from. Uh, Oh, should I do that one? No, so we'll go to yeah, Kayla from Allegate Mortgages. Uh, it comes back to, I suppose, hints and tips, really. Um, you know, what advice would you, would you give to, um, to an advisor out there who would either like to be busier or, you know, simply just busier in a business area where, you know, some of these brilliant customer outcomes can actually be, you know, can actually be delivered. So, what would you what would you say to to Sunday? What would you say to uh, to to Kayla? So she she'd like to be busier, um, more generally, but also yeah. particularly in this bridging space. So how does she best market her services and originate opportunity? You know, one one of the first points I'd say is you know webinars like this, you know, which are educational for the market. It's you know if anyone wants to learn something new, they they need to they need to proactively get take part so this sort of stuff's excellent hopefully you know the, the last hour or so you know there's been some tips in there already but you know you've got to look at policy as well government policy as well because that gives you an indication potentially to anticipate where the market may be no one's got a crystal ball i think we all know that from um, looking at the government and how they handle certain things shall we say over the last 12 months but the reality is is there is the changes to planning permission which will allow uh, uh, easier, you know, conversions take place. So is that an opportunity? There is um, for foreign nationals. There's a like there's a, from April two percent surcharge coming in. So again, that's another opportunity. Particularly in London, you get a lot of inquiries on that. I'm not necessarily saying it's going to impact the market thereafter because that's a high net worth market. But again, that's another thing. And then. CGT, you know, the government are considering increasing CGT, and that would be an impact on the market. So you, you've got to pay attention, I would say, to the wider policy in the, in, in the market, in, in the economy, to, to pick out the opportunities, because we've already touched on numerous examples where bridging is directly involved and can help. But to get a bigger picture of what you could be in, you have to pay attention to government policy. Okay, I mean, I, I saw an article at the weekend where it said 89, so that, that, that age range, 25 to 34, 89% of those millennials were actually going to be taking out some kind of um, refinance this year to home improve. So I suppose, I don't know whether you've seen many of these, Gareth, but these you know, millennials coming, I suppose, getting on the housing ladder, particularly in London, South East, and you know, next door to you in your big mansion, they, um, they, 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 they've probably bought some rundown property to actually get on that housing ladder, but then they need the next stage of, 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 of finance to just home, home improve. Is that a, like a kind of customer profile you've increasingly seen over the last six months, 12 months? Yeah, very much so. Um, I, I think it's been brought on by a few different things. People are looking at the, the opportunistic end of the marketplace. So looking at probate sales, auction sales, dilapidated properties, which are, are deemed unmortgageable to the, the mainstream because they don't like the pea green bathroom suite. Um, so they deem it as unlettable from that perspective. So there's an opportunistic point there to have a look at properties where you can add value to. And that goes back to, to you know, the cost base you were talking about earlier as well. You know, how, how expensive is it? Is, is it worthwhile? But if you can make money out of a transaction, then it's obviously worthwhile. I think anybody would spend £10,000 to make £20,000. It's the nature of the beast. Um, just going a little bit back as well to what you were saying there and, and, and what Sandeep was touching on. I think there's two things that I always say to every single one of the salespeople within this business is there's two P's that you should always be very, very much mindful of, and that's positivity. But for my, for my turn, it's, it's proactivity. And it's, it's actually going out there and trying to search for opportunity because ultimately you, you're not going to be able to invest your time and energy into coming into the bridging market if you don't understand it. You're not going to be able to invest your time and energy in, in doing bridging transactions or specialist transactions if you don't go and source that client. 
um, if you turn around and t uh, say to a client, you don't do something, that's your first opportunity of losing a deal. So then if you're not quite comfortable in delivering that product to them, utilize somebody like yourself who has that expertise, but you still own that client. So again, it's that proactive nature of sourcing something that is suitable for that client at that moment in time. You know, yesterday you would have turned around and said, pick up the yellow pages, um, pick up the Thompson's directory and, and trawl through the building firms. Sandeep and I know who, who used to always say this, but trawl through all those kind of things. But there's a high street out there, there's estate agencies out there, you know, there's building firms out there, there's a lot of data on people of planning applications, um, as, as Sandeep said previously, PD schemes, you know, there's all that data out there, that significant data that shows you that people are transacting in that space, go and find those people, yeah. find a route to the market. I mean, Gary, that permitted development to the PD, obviously the re relaxation of rules, that ability to be able to move commercial and retail into into residential is it again is that an area you're seeing you know, more and more of and is it a, a, have you got a, your particular sweet spots within the range yeah we, we've seen quite a significant shift in that um and certainly permitted development rights has, has relaxed a, a lot of opportunities so certainly you know some of the the more traditional kind of commercials over into residential and things like that um it has, has been has been quite significant over the last few months and i think that's likely to continue to be truthful um obviously you just have to be a little bit careful because uh, some people sometimes believe they've got permitted development rights when actually they haven't you probably see these as you come through uh jason as, as you start screening some of the, the deals that happen uh, but yeah you know that we, we've had a, a nice little sweet spot on there you know we, we'll look at things up to 75 percent percent loan to value we, we can do them at you know 72 and a half percent rates and we've got discounted rates at 0.54s and all sorts of things in there to try and cater for these things uh you know i think a, a, a at lowest headline rate at the most 0.54 so there's lots of opportunity for people who, who want to follow that route uh, and certainly from an investment point of view as well but interestingly you know when, when you just just backing up really what the guys said about you know trying to find new opportunities agree with everything they've got got to do there uh, but also I, th I think a lot of brokers in, and this is goes back of over 30 years of, of being in the industry now just over 30 years i must add uh is, is you know, me that just mate just but I'd, uh, you know it's, it's about actually the brokers looking to diversify the, their own range you know um you know look at the products in the market that they aren't currently offering and uh, and that and that's just not about bridging finance of course i mean that about you know whether offering uh, mortgages second charges buy to lets hmos uh, cbtls as gareth touched on before mixed use or commercial type of mortgages and finance and of course bridging finance in all those sectors you know in, in the years that i've been in the industry i've seen many successful brokers who have doubled and trebled their income by simply having a broader product range and evolving that product range to suit every customer's needs without having to increase their lead flow. It's just that they've been able to yeah. work with more customers and get them delivered. And, yeah. and you should aim to convert every inquiry, uh, you know, with a suitable product. On the flip side of that, I've seen brokers fall away and fail as they've concentrated on just one or two products within the yeah. market. And then when the more difficult times come, uh, they've not they've seen a dramatic reduction obviously in their income because they didn't have a plan b where there's other products that may come to the fore uh you know we saw that in the last credit crunch where mortgages kind of fell off a cliff for a period but bridging finance was born uh in, in in its in its guise as it is today although it's been around for such a long time so for me i, I think you know brokers should look to diversify educate themselves gain the knowledge of all the market sectors and if they don't have the capacity or resource internally, utilise the skills of a specialist broker like yourself. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. And um, I suppose one final question before I summarise and, uh, and close, if that's OK. And we've probably got you know, 10 second sound bite from, yeah, from each of you. And it's relating to the, you know, the stamp duty deadline. So does it get extended? Yes, no, in 10 seconds. So uh, as soon as you're on screen, Gary, start with, yeah, with you. So stamp duty, yes, no. Does it get extended? Um, yeah, I think they will extend it for the things that are in flight at the moment. I'd like to think that will extend it for a much longer period to maintain the economy. OK, Sunday. I think yes, but only for those property uh, transactions that have exchanged. I think it's been available since it's been announced since July, the deadline. People have had time to get on it. Yeah, Gareth. 
I'm just going to say no then, just to have a difference. <laughs> I, I think Sunday's quite right. It, it's been there for quite some time, so I don't think they're going to invest their time and energy in that. They're going to look at other alternatives and maybe a revamp as, as a whole. Yeah, look, I think any flexibility that does get offered, it'll be done at the absolute the eleventh hour. And if 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 there is that slim chance, it'll be something to do with with pipeline, if anything at all. So, yes. um, yeah, if, if the previous track record is anything to go by, we'd say it's a we'd say it's a no. Listen, I just want to summarise really. And um, so, look, British fans, what we've said undoubtedly as we've gone through the yeah the last sixty minutes, yeah, there's absolutely terrific benefits when it comes to speed. We've got the most competitive pricing we've ever had. We've got the most competitiveness we've ever had amongst um, uh, lenders and 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 uh, participants in the marketplace. We've got some great LTVs. We've got an opportunity, certainly on the capital raising side, um, on the rebridge side. So we've got more and more um, uh, situations where you know the exit, which is absolutely imperative, just because of circumstances, has, has just created an issue. So there's rebridge opportunities, capital raising opportunities, and undoubtedly your know, regulated bridging opportunity, which means this is not just about you know delivering short-term solutions for investment customers, investment um, you know landlords now. So you know it's, it's available to you know, every man and his his dog in terms of in terms of profile. Look at we you know, we appreciate the three of you guys. We you know we love dealing with. Um, all three of your businesses. It's a big year and um, that brings loads of opportunities for, yeah, for us all. We're optimistic, we're pragmatic and I think you know, irrespective of what happens with stamp duty, there's, you know, there's going to be life beyond that. And even if that moves into a, 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 a debt consolidation marketplace, we're going to keep getting uh, information from our distribution, keep sharing it with you so we can shape and influence funding for the future. And, you know, as I say, we, we, we just appreciate partnering with, with you guys. So I want to thank you for your time today. Thank all the, the participants and the audience who've attended today. And hopefully you've got some nice um, hints and tips and information as we've gone through the last 60 minutes. So, you know, we, as I say, we appreciate you guys and you know, many, many thanks um, yeah, for taking part. Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. All right. Thank so, you. Thanks, Thank guys. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone.